Uh, but yeah, stock continue being reported. So uh, yeah, some some good news. So uh, in response to the August meeting uh, that we had over, uh, excuse me, at, on Douglas Boulevard, um, we instituted some new procedures, uh, moved some things around to kind of uh, address some public safety issues. Uh, and in my humility, I learned some very valuable lessons. Uh, my first lesson was. Uh, I told a group of officers, I was like, you guys are going to go out here and you're going to you're going to write uh, some tickets and, uh, you know, make make life a little bit better over there in the bar district, in the bar areas. And they kind of go, oh, we kind of already do that every day. So they, there wasn't a whole lot of enthusiasm about it. Uh, so I kind of saw their point of view from it that I really needed to incentivize them to do something. Uh, and be creative in how they do it instead of just the typical cops going out and writing tickets, which they don't really like and the public usually doesn't like it either. Uh, so instead, we kind of mixed things up. So we did some uh, patrols uh, on foot. Uh, we had our ATV and our golf cart out, made some really good community contacts, had a lot of fun. Uh, we did some work in plain clothes and in unmarked cars. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm going to loop back to that here in just a second. Uh, and then we did some just some traditional uh, just police saturation of an area just just to see what we would get and enforce enforce some of the laws that we came across. What we encountered and what we learned uh, was there were a whole lot more illegal gun possession and illegal drugs being sold and used than we had expected. So we ended up devoting quite a bit of time to that. And not as much time to like the loud music and checking on the bars that I kind of had expected. Uh, so we learned some lessons. Um, this was a temporary initiative. Um, I, I still don't have the staffing to be able to do something like this uh, on a on a daily or weekly basis or a permanent basis. Uh, but based on the numbers, which were a total of 27 arrests, uh, we did uh, seize 15 guns and we towed like 13 cars. Uh, based on that, based on the information that we gathered from that, I think I've convinced uh, the chief's office to start giving me some more, some more resources, some more officers, so that we can make something like this permanent. Um, and it's something that's really needed. Uh, downtown business district has this same kind of uh, format where they have a small group of officers dedicated that just patrol and just work in the downtown business district. That's what I want to replicate right there in the Highlands. Uh, we'll also give some attention up to uh, Frankfurt Avenue, Bargetown Road, but the primary emphasis will be right there in the Highlands, right there on Bargetown Road, uh, around the bars and the businesses that, that get a lot of traffic. So we learned some lessons. Uh, we've made some good headway. And I think now I've got support of, uh, of, of District 8 and District 9, uh, the Chief's Office, the Chief. So hopefully, uh, knock on wood, everything goes well. We can get some more uh, officers here in the 5th Division and make this permanent. Yay. Any questions, concerns, sir? Uh, two questions. Did, yeah. Did, did you find the shootings that have been occurring on Barstown Road at night? Was there more of a connection with the drugs and the guns and the bars? And the second question uh, the Barstown Road area near Garden Lane and the uh, Waterton, uh, what's your all policy relative to the homelessness that's spread out in that area over there? Okay. Uh, so as far as, uh, so back in July, we we did have, there was three shooting murders and, and one of them being right there uh, at Bonnie Castle. Were they connected? At least loosely. I really can't go into details, but yes, at least loosely, there are some uh, common things that we were coming across on who was possessing the guns and where they were at and what they were doing. So certainly there is what, what we would call in law enforcement, there's a nexus between the two. Uh, as far as Gardner Lane and the homeless, uh, we just had a, the, the city has gone to a different direction on how they're going to address uh, homelessness, houselessness. Um, there's going to be a new format on how we deal with it. Uh, the city is really devoted a lot of resources to help us out. Uh, just a couple things that are in the works is, is, is what's called the living room project. We did this uh Back when it ended in 2018, the idea behind this is this a place that we can take somebody that needs services that doesn't have anywhere to go 
and the police can drop them off at this place, hands-free, and the living room has 24 hours to find them services, to find them help, to get them whatever they need. But it's a place, it's a temporary place that we can take people that need that help, get them off the street quickly. No arrests, no seasoned property, uh, none of the headache and, and, and paperwork that goes along with it. Uh, it's just a drop-off point. We loved it. It went out because of the budgets, the, the budget issue that happened there uh, about five or six years ago. Uh, so that's going to come back in at least some format. Uh, the city has helped us out a whole lot and given us some guidance on what, what they want to see done as far as arrests and, and enforcement. We still want to be kind of on the low side, but we do have the green light to do what we need to do now. Uh, there's some hiccups still that need to be uh, addressed as far as what's public property versus private property. Uh, and, and the biggest thing here I'm talking about is the uh, tarp stops. So, so we got to work that out just a little bit. Uh, that's, we're getting real close with that. Uh, and we, we were getting all the support we need to come and clear out the camps, at least the larger ones, in a much more timely fashion. So uh, Public Works and RCS are really on board about getting somebody out there quickly to assess it, uh, to get the notices up faster, and then to get it cleaned out faster. So hopefully here in the next four, five, six months, we're going to see a big improvement in it, and it's going to help us out a whole lot on our side. Countywide? Countywide, yes, sir. And I can speak a little bit to some of that also. Uh, not right now, but... um, the news story said that there were multiple felons with guns arrested. Mm -hmm. Are they being prosecuted and... Kept in jail. I'll, 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 we arrested them. They're all they're all getting prosecuted. Uh, as far as they being kept in jail, I have not followed back up on how many have been released. I'll tell you, probably most of them at this point have been have posted bond, have been granted HIP, uh, but they they are definitely all being definitely all being prosecuted. Yes. And I just wanted to say that issue about us. At the public library, when we're all looking at the office, we go on Tuesday, we have somebody who can tell that it ended with people who are having issues with um, housing. Um, but I also have a contact, so if they come at another time and they really need help, um, I've got contact for them. All right. Thank you all. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. And cannot thank the cooperation of the community as well as the cooperation of this district. Thank you. Ben, I think you're a busy man. You may have a little update on a few things that you are participating in. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to talk about summer below or do you want to do that? I think you should fill us in. Okay. Uh, ben Reno Weber, Metro Council Person, District 8. I see in this room a lot of people who have really cool news to share, and so I'm not going to take super long. I'm mostly going to be question-driven. A uh, couple of things that are really cool. We are seeing uh, a lot of new businesses opening, including uh, Ms. Riley's, which is going to be great. We Hotwork, Hotworks uh, just opened. The Myriad Hotel just opened with the phenomenal bar and restaurant Paseo. If you haven't tried it out, it's pretty awesome. Um and there is a new uh, American themed with a Cuban flair restaurant going into what was the vacant, long time vacant Mellow Mushroom, which is exciting. Uh, I just met with the owner there. Uh, I will just say a lot of people were concerned that they were planning to open a club. That is not the plan. The plan is a restaurant that is American food. Uh, and he's very excited. So happy that he will come here also. Uh, so lots of good economic activity. Uh, we passed the short term rental uh laws which i think made everybody just a little bit unhappy even airbnb was like all right i see what you did there nice job uh which is good uh certainly neighborhood associations were thrilled uh even some of the the commercial investors were like okay i can work in those very clear arrangements uh tourism bureau is happy so i think when you get a unanimous piece of legislation through metro council that has gotten pretty good feedback from everybody, that's a win. So that's a win. Um, uh, thing that is a little bit sad from the perspective of Bardstown Road aglow is that the mayor moved Light Up Louisville to the same weekend. Uh, he, 
He did it uh, because the Light Up Louisville has traditionally been over Thanksgiving weekend. And what that meant was that all of the folks who worked that event then had to not have that weekend with their families. So, okay, fine. Be good to our first responders and EMS and the police. Okay, I get it. Uh, however, what they're going to do is cross promote and and the mayor's office is going to come do our, at least maybe the mayor, certainly someone from his office is going to come do our tree uh, and then migrate downtown. I think that's a pretty good solution after that happened. Uh, so good stuff there. Uh, as Major mentioned, really interesting, good stuff around the entertainment district, I think, generally happening. Uh, I've been meeting with uh, restaurant workers and musicians to talk about some of the, the issues that are that they're seeing with stuff that has been talked about. So really trying to get as much community input as possible. Love to talk to you. Um, but have been meeting with lots of bar owners uh, along the district uh, to just understand how do we work on the issues that we actually care about. Right. So rather than get super distracted by the fight, the media is trying to have us fight about is this 4 a.m. versus 2 a.m. What do we actually care about? We care about violence and separately we care about noise. Those are the two issues. Let's keep our eye on that particular prize. So that uh, and then medium term, uh, Major Grissom referenced that sort of the next air that the next area of real focus for me uh, but also with uh, the mayor's office is really how do we create medium term solutions to address houselessness and substance use up and down the corridor, but across the city. First thing is we do not have nearly enough appropriate shelter space. Uh, so when you wonder why people are living in a tent over the over under the overpass, if the alternative is being in a dorm where you can't take your dog you split up families and you have to leave at 7 a.m., I also probably would not choose that. So we need as a city to create better spaces there. And then what is the, the pathway out of that? So into supportive housing, uh, into affordable housing. So I think there's really good momentum behind a lot of that. One of the things that I have been obsessed with that I will just keep talking about is this idea of deflection. Because often when somebody is passed out in front of Carmichael's. We don't really want a police response. We want a behavioral health response. The police do not want to be the ones responding to that because it distracts them from all the other stuff that we would like them to be doing. And it's they didn't sign up to be the PP patrol because somebody peed on the side of the building, right? They signed up to do police things. We want behavioral health workers to do that because they know the resources better. Turns out almost everybody experiencing houselessness is eligible for Medicaid. Medicaid does not want to pay for that person to go to the ER or the jail. There's a path forward here. It's just going to take us a little time to work through it. All right, I'm going to stop talking and I'll take a couple minutes of questions or no. Okay, I'll take a couple minutes of questions. If there are any. Well, there should be. So we've experienced quite a few people slumbering on our um, on our office. So and we have called and the police do come. So when you were talking about behavioral health, who who is there someone that you call for that or you're wishing? So I, I'm going to, there right now, 911 is still the best place to call. We are expanding a pilot deflection project that I have a, a presentation in my inbox, working closely with the mayor's office around expanding it as quickly as possible. So the answer right now is still call 911. There will be another number to call soon. Uh, but I don't want to put it out there until we're ready to actually staff it because the worst thing that happens is you call and we're not actually ready for it. So soon is the answer. Call five seven four seven one one one. That's non emergency dispatch. Don't call nine one one. Call five seven four seven one one one. That's non emergency dispatch. Thank you. Let's leave the nine one one for emergency because I'm having to get back. I don't want to talk about all these people. Yeah. Yeah, and huge shout out to Highland Ministry, Community Ministries for all the amazing work that you all do frontline. Like, you guys are doing really awesome stuff and we're grateful. What's next on your plate? I know you've had a barrage, but now where are you and your check off list? Uh, the next thing that I'm really working on is I believe that we can provide better frontline services as a city if we connect into the public health system. So how do we bill Medicaid for the stuff that we want to be doing as a city won't address everything, 
but man, it'll help a lot. And so we're working both in the government side of that. Uh, we've got a really good, we, we will by the end of the year have a detailed analysis of all the places within city government in which we could be doing that. I heard that directly from Deputy Mayor Maton yesterday. So that's awesome. And then the nonprofit side, I'm part of a group that is convening nonprofits who are providing frontline services like the community ministries around how do we set up a community-wide infrastructure for billing Medicaid for these services we're already providing, which should drastically increase the level of resources that we have to provide. So those are the two things that I'm just like front and center on. Anything else? Join your local neighborhood associations. We're building out a directory of all of them. We're going to soon, at some point soon, we'll have a map so you can put in your address and it'll tell you what neighborhood association uh, that you're in. Join your neighborhood association is the best and most efficient way to organize around the issues that we care about. Yep. Already on the list. You got it, sir. Ah, the, the question was, would you add cities uh, to the list? I met with Strathmore Gardens last week, and we'll, we're working on it. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. And I really do want to thank Ben for making some lemonade because of the lemon we've been served. Um, onward and upward. Uh, I know the partnership from Louisville Metro Department of Ignite Development. We do have a representative here today. Yes. I thought someone used the word. There is a new division in Ignite Development, and they are forming direct partnerships with the local businesses. Um, well, I was hopeful they called in saying they wanted to talk about that new position and, again, the mm -hmm. what the goals are. Uh, what happens in our government is that we get so many layers of direction that a business owner has very few places they can go one place and find out everything. This partnership is supposed to be a coordinating effort. And again, the mayor, I'll give them credit, they acknowledge the confusion a business owner has in getting the best services that we do offer. So uh, it's a new position and we'll follow up uh, with more information as they provide it. Um, now, October is coming, and I know we have uh, more than one reason to look for excitement. And on October the 21st, I believe, is our community area cleanup. And we have a representative from Brightside today to sort of cheer us on to the welcoming of fall. Thank you, Elizabeth. See if I can, you can see me above this. Maybe not. Um, is that too hard on you? All it's right, up to you all. You, you flex, can see me or not. <laughs> if you flex where you're comfortable, at least they saw okay. who you are. So they yes. know who you are. So you I'll be go. like on the side. Um, so I'm from Brightside, and we are actually a part of Louisville Metro, but we also operate as a nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> our main, main focus is litter abatement issues around Louisville. We also try to work on expanding Louisville's tree canopy. Um, you've probably seen some bright sites. There's one by Cave Hill. That's probably the closest to here. Um, so we have some beautification efforts and then environmental education, um, mostly targeted toward children, but we're trying to kind of build an adult education program. Um, so I know Nick is organized something for the Commerce Guild on the 21st. So we do this twice a year in spring and fall where we encourage any group you know, across Louisville to do a cleanup on the same day. So when you're just doing part of Bardstown Road, you know that someone's mm -hmm. doing Lindview or you know Crescent Hill, places all around. Um, <clears throat> so I have some flyers, if maybe you'll hang them like in your workplace or at the Neighborhood Association meeting room. Cherokee Triangle will be having one same day as the uh, fall festival, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then also, if you don't want to organize your own, we will be having one at High Wire. It's our sweep and sip, what that we call. Um, so if beer motivates you. You come, we're going to clean up kind of around that area, and then you get a little reward from High Wire. Um, so any questions? Uh, generally speaking, uh, Nick is very good at this mm -hmm. city fall. We will have supplies available. If you all need additional supplies, let us know so that we can all coordinate that. Uh, if you give the flyer to Amy, she'll put Absolutely. it in our yeah. website, promote it through our channels. Yeah. Um, 
and mm -hmm. look forward to a, in the past, we've had an excellent participation and yeah. uh, greatly appreciate any new and up. How are the t-shirts coming this year? Let's get real. They might not be coming till spring, yeah. but okay. they're going to be very cool. Um, and anytime you want to organize a cleanup, it doesn't have to be on the 21st. We provide supplies for free. So just send me an email or call and we'll work it. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. All right. Now, I don't know if everybody knows it or not, but in our local government, we now have the Office of Arts and Creative Industries. And uh, we have also, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm right. Jessica, <laughs> would you please come up and sort of fill in people about this new and exciting opportunity? <clears throat> Good morning. No, you're good. I can. It's either you or Ben. I have a presentation to share. Being in the arts office, I have to have visual aids, right? Um, so my name is Jessica Kincaid. I'm the director of the Office of Arts and Creative Industries within Louisville Metro, which is housed within the Cabinet of Economic Development. Um, this office uh, leads strategic initiatives to elevate the authenticity and the vibrancy of our community by supporting artists, creative businesses, and cultural nonprofits. Um, this office was established and then um, Metro Council passed a resolution to designate it as the uh, designated local arts agency for Louisville Metro. And what that means and why that matters is that um, that's a designation that the National Endowment for the Arts and Americans for the Arts pays attention to. Um, and it gives Metro access to apply for increased funding that we can subgrant and then put back into the community. So the local arts agency um, sort of has a defined set of functions that you can see in the presentation. Um, after Metro was designated as the local arts agency, we recognized that to serve our community best, we were going to need a partner, at least in the short term, um, until this office was really up and running um, and staffed and resourced to the level that it needed to be. So we put out an RFQ for a nonprofit to partner with us, and that was awarded to the Fund for the Arts. Mm -hmm. Um, which we have a long standing history of working with and producing cultural programming. So it's a really natural fit. Um, and so this is um, one of the other things that Metro actually gets as part of this designated LAA status is since it's one of the largest 60 cities by population in the country, we also now have a seat and representation on the United States Urban Arts Federation Board, uh, which is a national network of local arts leaders, local agency arts le leaders who um, are working collectively to inform and influence policy, um, arts policy across the country. And so you'll see kind of how Metro stacks up against our 60 peer cities in that regard. Um, in terms of staffing, you're looking at it. I'm an office of one currently. Um, I do get to add a staff position later this year, so that's very exciting. We'll double the size of the office. Um, and in terms of budget, uh, we're actually pretty competitive across the country, so that's really exciting. And I wanted to just show you quickly how our program's budget breaks out. The FY24 fiscal year um, allocated about $2.5 million for arts programming throughout Metro. That includes um, our EAF grant making programs, that includes the public art program, cultural pass, and um, the new initiative called HEARTS. Um, so what's really exciting about that is that in as recently as two years ago, I think the allocation of arts funding per capita was less than a dollar. And now it's closer to $2.21, which is competitive to the national average. It's actually higher than the national average. So um, Louisville is leading the way on that front. Um, my office partners with a lot of local agencies and the way that that programming budget gets dispersed through um, to the community is through partner programs. Um, we again have a partnership with Fund for the Arts to do cultural pass and um, the hearts program. We partner with the free Louisville free public library also on cultural pass and a number of other initiatives. And this is just a small smattering of agencies that we work with regularly. Um, so here's a bit more information about cultural pass. We just uh, celebrated our 10th year of the program. Um, so that's been growing increasingly over those years. Uh, we've dispersed 264,000 cultural passes throughout the city, which equates to um, approximately about the same number of free arts experiences. Uh, we are looking to continue to um, decrease barriers um, to, to that program in terms of transportation and in terms of uh, language translation services. Um, 
we would really ultimately like to see that program expanded year round and maybe to increase um, the age demographics. It's currently for uh, students mm -hmm. or youth age zero to 21 and an accompanying adult. So we are always looking for ways to expand that. And then the Louisville Hearts program is a program that was launched. Um, we just completed its first year and it's a community arts uh, based program that's focused on healing and community cohesion and social networking and things like that to uh, recover from isolation that was felt during COVID and a lot of the divisiveness that was experienced during that same period of time. Um, so we supported, I think, 11 different teaching artists, and there were over 6,000 participants in that program um, in all of the Louisville Free Pro Public Library branches and um, there's a typo on that slide. It is more than one Metro Community Center. It's uh, 15. So sorry about that. And then this is just a general overview of our grant making programs that the office runs. Um, this year, we were able to award $600,000 in external agency grant funding. Uh, we had 125 applicants and we were able to fund 38 programs that serve every single Metro Council District. Um, I think there are four of those agencies based here in District 4. Um, we're also always looking for ways to supplement and increase that uh, that grant making fund. So we work with the National Endowment for the Arts. We were as the LAA, we were able to secure um, ARP funding exclusive to LAAs to subgrant to our arts agencies. Um, and we also pursue philanthropic funds through Bloomberg Foundation and um, and others. So the new focus of the office is the creative industries. And this um, office was moved and elevated within the Department of, or the Cabinet of Economic Development. And it has a long history of partnering with advanced planning. My advanced planning colleagues are standing at the, loitering at the back of the room um, on placemaking initiatives through the public art program. Um, but now I'm also working very closely with the um, Office of Economic Development. There's currently a um, strategic planning process going on for economic development for the city. Um, my goal is to make sure that the creative industries um, are accounted for in that economic strategic plan. Um, interested to provide more professional services to individual working artists and creative entrepreneurs, thinking about how we can tailor small business programs that currently exist through Metco or other, um, other products that economic development offers for creative industries. Um, the first step in that is to get a clear picture of what Louisville's creative economy looks like. So we're working with an organization called Westaff who has a tool to um, pull pull data from vetted sources about um, industry revenues, the number of jobs in certain industries, those kinds of things. So we're really working through the process of defining what constitutes Louisville's creative economy, what jobs classify um, or in that classification. Some cities include culinary arts and the creative economy. We have a hospitality cluster and economic development. So we're working through, is there overlap? Is it partitioned separately um, so that we can really kind of distill, uh, drill down the data on that? And then lastly, and probably most familiar is the public art program. Um, Metro first established their public art program in 2010. Uh, we wrote a public art master plan. We developed a funding mechanism that's um, based in our, our land development code. Um, it's a fee in lieu for outdoor amenities for certain types of developments. It historically has not been very successful. So we're rethinking that, um, pursuing some other funding avenues. Um, but we have been able to still produce a number of large scale public and still fund community art projects as well. Um, we also oversee the maintenance and conservation of our collection, which is uh, comprised of over 300 pieces of artwork. And this year the budget was increased for that um, those efforts. So that's exciting. We've contracted with a conservation lab who will be routinely coming to Louisville to inspect our collection, make recommendations about pieces that need treatment next. And our current project that we're working on is a public art mapping project. And um, Quest introduced themselves earlier, and uh, they are working with my office and with Louisville Tourism to map um, neighborhoods throughout Louisville. So to verify that the artwork that Metro owns is where we think it is, and that it's still in good condition, and also to document things that are we, we would refer to as art in public space. So it's not art that Metro owns, but it's definitely in the public realm, and we would like to know about it. So um, what they're doing is, uh, again, verifying the, the locations, identifying new pieces, trying to do some research about um, who produced that public art. So uh, we've started with three neighborhoods and 
they're concluding the third, which is the Highlands. So they may come to your business and knock on your door and say, hey, you have this really awesome mural on your wall. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Did you commission it? Do you know where it came from? Was it in the building when you when you moved in? Um, so these are a couple of the pieces that have been cataloged recently. The one on the right by Chris Chapel is brand new, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have some cards that um, if they come visit your business, they may drop off with you. You can pick them up today. Um, if you scan the QR code, it will take you to a public survey because we are crowdsourcing some of this information um, to get, you know, community input. If somebody says, hey, you know what, I made that mural and they can tell us all about it or somebody just happens to know the story about it. There, are, I heard a couple of people say they were lifelong residents of the Highlands, so they may have some backstory that we don't. And then if you're a business owner and you want to know, this may be really small on the screen, I apologize. Um, if you want to know how to um, commission public art for your space, the question that I get asked all the time is, how do I go about making doing a public art project? And the answer is always, well, it depends. And it's based on a lot of different criteria. If you're in a historic preservation district, if it's in the public right of way, if it's, you know, there are a lot of different agencies that can govern um, the permits and permissions that might be required. So I worked with a Bingham Fellows group during this last class who wanted to produce a resource guide for those who are interested in activating cultural or uh, cultural activations in public space. And it's a very lengthy document that walks people through the conceptual and the logistics. Um, but I wanted to point to this page in particular because it does a really nice job of um, logic charting, uh, it, you know, if this, then that. So that is available on the Metro Arts and Creative Industries website in full form. Um, so moving forward, um, our next step is to put out an RFQ for a comprehensive cultural plan for the city, which will include an update to our public art master plan. And also we'll synthesize a lot of the um, like Fund for the Arts did the Imagine 2025 plan. And I know that the Kentucky Center is going through some strategic planning. It's not to reinvent the wheel and draft a new document. It's to assess what um, cultural planning tools are out there currently and synthesize them and identify the ways that the city can best support mm -hmm. that. Um, and then it will also include some uh, creative economy audit and strategy recommendations for that. Um, the Commission on Public Art, which is a, a board that reports to my office, um, is also investigating this idea of perhaps doing a cultural tourism event centered around public art. Um, there'll be more information about that forthcoming. And then this is contact information for my office. So that's all I got for you. It's a lot. <laughs> Any questions? As far as maybe tying something people relate to, uh, Nick Morris has been really involved in our mural highlands. Uh, mm -hmm. Over the years, some of them have become very warm. Mm -hmm. Now, we, through our own efforts, have had artists come back, touch up, and do maintenance. Is it possible for you all to help the coordinator become involved in maintaining these things that you're categorizing? Um, Just that. Yeah, so the conservation funds that are allocated to, this, mm -hmm. um, to the city are for the city's collection. Um, Usually when we have a newly commissioned work, we would do probably a very similar arrangement where we would work with the artists to bring them back. There's a piece that's installed on the waterfront that was part of the Connect Disconnect public art exhibition several years ago. Um, and in fact, the city is routinely contracts that artist to come back as well. Um, as far as new projects, we will have a mural grant opportunity that's going to be available later this year. Um, but again, we are looking for ways to um, expand funding, not just for programs, but for projects. So a lot of the um, LAA funding that we might be eligible for going forward could contribute to that. Well, I know Nick, as we had, before this all came up, there are several spots that are viable for, but it was in my brain, hopefully, that along the way, they would make some arrangements to help keep it going. Because mm -hmm. we do have one mm -hmm. over at the, that's uh, so deteriorated, I don't think we can say it enough. Mm -hmm. Which one is that? Chuck Bruins, mm -hmm. uh, the photograph mm -hmm. that's next to the mail. Yeah. Uh, it, it's bad shape. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Uh, on your public art, is, is that mostly within inside the water center of the train of water? Um, I will say that that map, we are still, yeah, we are expanding this. This is sort of phase one, um, but it is. No, it's it's all of the neighborhoods. It'll be for all of Louisville. It will take some time. Like I said, we're just concluding our third neighborhood. Um, 
the idea is that the information gathered through this will eventually populate an app or some sort of um, tour promotion uh, tool that we could do, but it is meant to encompass the whole the whole city. Good question. Uh, what's the difference between the red signals and the oh, blue ones? Yes. So this map, a version of this map is on Metro's website currently. Mm -hmm. um, and those indicators are, um, there's a key. So the yellow ones, I believe, are artworks in public space. So things that don't belong to Metro. Um, the red ones are pieces that belong to Metro. Oh, they're murals, sorry. Um, and the blue ones are the pieces that belong to Metro. So they the red ones and the blue ones both belong to Metro. No, the red ones, the red ones are murals. Oh. So we're kind of pulling those out a little bit separately. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you. Well, so thank much. you so much. Well, uh, I think it's a toss up in my brain, but I know the real reason why you're all here is because we have our drawing. And the good news about the drawing, and it's not over with, the drawing is before the really good stuff. That's our shameless promotion time. But this drawing's a little different. Nick, why don't you come here and tell a little bit about the drawing? Because I think it's exciting. Good morning again, everyone. Um, Unfortunately, um, the owner of the WNB factory wasn't able to join us this morning. <clears throat> His name is Nick Park, but he has graciously offered uh, five $20 gift certificates to his restaurant, which is going to be opening shortly. So we will do that drawing in just a minute. But I also wanted to mention there's a lot of activity kind of going on in that 1000 block. Uh, obviously, the WNB factory is going to be opening Right next to that is the former uh, Steel City Pops, which is going to become part of a new Quills uh, location. And then right next to that is the Mellow Mushroom, which Ben touched on uh, earlier, that is going to be um, be opening soon as well. So, and then of course, a little bit further down in that same block, um, the former Hopcat is now Bakersfield, that is open. So a lot of good activity there. Uh, one little bit of a downside is that you all may have heard that, but Urban Outfitters is gonna be closing their Highlands location. They're gonna be moving to Oxmoor. So anyway, that is down, but but Stephanie is here with um, the, um, what is that? The Surprise Lily Boutique, I think especially clothing store for women. So that will be opening uh, next week, in fact, I believe. So that's at 1356. Bartstown Road. So again, we have to continue to work uh, to keep these spaces filled. That's kind of the lifeblood of the Highlands is to have these storefronts filled up. So with, with good good businesses. So getting back to um, the uh, WNB factory, we have um, I've listed everyone's name here that has is joining us today, and a corresponding number next to it. And whomever Aaron draws out will be the winner. <clears throat> And number seven, number seven is uh, Jessica Kincaid. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you draw. Number three is Ann Lindauer. Number two is Larry Williams. Um, that is <clears throat> Jack Will. Number nine. 
Number nine is uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Riley. <clears throat> Hey, and a few you folks that um, <clears throat> were the lucky winners, if you'll just see me after the meeting, just give me your name and phone number. We'll contact you and get that uh, $28 gift certificate to you. And um, just one final thing, I'd like to give a, a shout out again to the uh, LMP 5th Division, LMPD, uh, and Major Grissom, of course, being here um, for the Great work you all been doing. You, you had an eight day period there. I mean, it was like what, 15 guns and eight arrests and a number of illegal, you know, illegally parked vehicles were towed. So um, that is great news in my mind. So um, I think in many, for many people coming into the Highlands, they think it's a place where anything goes and we want to maintain that to a certain extent. But obviously there's, when you cross that line, uh, we've got the folks here with fifth division that's going to address that issue. So. Uh, Again, thanks very much for your efforts. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. All right. Uh, now, Gilda's Club has been a gracious host to us ever since they started. What the, our, our meetings have been at the old location and well as the new. Uh, on Saturday, October 28th, uh, they are having a celebration here for families, friends, for fall festival. That's October 28th from 11 till two. Along with that, they're doing a fundraiser called Wigs Raffle. Uh, first prize uh, is two VIP tickets, to Taylor Swift. Uh, of the people wanting something more homegrown, uh, old uh, Rip Van Winkle is prize number two, 107 proof fan, so you can line up. <laughs> uh, so if you want additional information, it's on the back table uh, to you are all right back in the corner. And again, support Gildas. They've done excellent work in our community. They've helped my family and many people I know. They are there to be of assistance to this community and have done so year after year. Uh, now, shameless promotions. Hani, you mentioned it earlier, but do you want to reiterate October 10th? Hello. Come away. Yay! And I want to thank a person who is not a morning person. She isn't, but she comes to our meeting. So we want to thank you for doing your work on the 8th District uh, yeah. group work. Uh, make sure that everyone knows about Tuesday, October 10th, uh, the Metro Conference uh, District 8 election forum. It's going to be uh, both candidates at RSVP. They will be there. Um, Flyers on the table. Uh, I'm sure Aaron will send it out for more information as well as the link. Yes. Have early and have fun. Yay! All right. Now, in all of this glory, I know some of you all have a special event or a discount or something you want to tell us. So please, this is your opportunity to let us all know what is coming up for the fun of it all. Yes. Okay. So okay. not paper at the Highlands Library. We do have two programs coming up. The first one that I've got here is Thursday, October 12th at 6 30. We're going to have Gilly stories in the Highlands. These are stories that you may or may not know received by local author Dan Longer. So and this is geared for the adults. So <laughs> and so that's going to be again Thursday, October 12th at 6 30. And then the other one, the next week, it's going to be Wednesday, October 18th at 6 30. It's going to be local off, uh, architect and historian Keith Weiser. He's doing a new program on a local urban neighborhood, a great places to live. And it also Features neighborhoods within the Watterson Expressway, uh, featuring distinctive house designs, uh, beautiful churches, and interesting business districts, all in these different communities. So we have those two programs. So we're going to go ahead. Thank you. Great. All right. I have a question for Mike Kane. Um, no cycle via is coming up. Have you all got the date set for that? We do. We have those two good things. So. <laughs> it's there. Uh, hey, everybody, my name is Mike Kane. I'm the director of Rural Metro Soft Planning. I have this new wedding as well today. Uh, 
show of hands, does anybody not know what Cyclovia in the Highlands is? We've been doing it since 2012. Anybody not been to Cyclovia in the Highlands before? So October 22nd, Sunday afternoon, 2 to 6 p.m. We open up, as we like to say, Barstown Road uh, to people and everybody comes out. Great time. It's a super fun afternoon. Uh, this is the original Cyclopedia that started here on Barstown Road. Uh, it will go from Douglas Loop up to Grinstead Drive, Eastern Parkway. It will be opened with traffic control. Um, so police will facilitate safe crossings there. Uh, we always say that this is only as good as the businesses that participate, which is why we do it in the Highlands every year. Um, as a business, anything you can do to support the event, even if it's just coming outside, shaking hands with people, giving out cards, uh, you'd be amazed at how many more people will see your business when they're walking or riding a bike to go a little bit slower than they are when they're driving, uh, and they'll come back. And even if they don't visit the event, it's a great opportunity. Um, so if you have here, please feel free to take one. We'll be kind of canvassing the corridor here in the next week or so, uh, passing some more of these out. If your business would like to do something in particular, please feel free to reach out to myself or Lou. Uh, if you just Google Cyclovia, it'll take you right to our webpage. That's all our contact information there. Uh, but let us know if you're going to do something for your business. We'll be happy to promote it on social media just to give everyone an idea how much you're doing. Thank you. In addition to that, it is it is an excellent opportunity, but I've had this conversation with a lot of businesses. They have to physically engage. And that's the part where people, they say, my door is open, they can walk in. For some reason, Cyclovia is exactly what Mike said, is a person-to-person -person contact. Mm -hmm. Passive is not Cyclovia. The businesses, I've watched it happen. I know one restaurant, they decided to serve iced tea had a line of 50 people. I'm not kidding. They lined up with their money, boom, boom, boom. So if you have a business on the strip or know someone, tell them to actively get outside their door and talk to people or do a little promotion. Uh, whatever you do, as far as food, make it pick up and go. Sit down restaurant may not be the thing, but food, uh, walking and eating is a wonderful hobby. Been there. <laughs> uh, and if you are... You're all brilliant people, I'm sure. But if you're looking for some ideas, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We've, we've seen what's been really successful for businesses, things like sidewalk shop, bubbles, little, little things like that that just attract attention and kids care about all the time. So um, keep that in mind. Please feel free to reach out if you have to help. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, we encourage you all to stick. There's still some fresh casino products. Stick around. Let's have a little conversations. And cannot thank you all enough for being here. Larry, tell, tell. Oh, Yeah, I'm just going to quickly mention everybody on October 21st, we're having a full festival in Willow Park. It does come inside on the bright side, but we're hoping everybody can get a face from that afterwards. We will get everything we do with the human being. We have beer, bourbon, rats. <laughs> we're having a bourbon pool. We did this in uh, the last couple of years and it was highly successful. Uh, and of course, we have to have music in the little park, it would be the same. So we've got two bands coming uh, in September, a couple of weeks throughout the day. And we will have children's activity, a little parade, we will be painting pumpkins, and it will be good, good weather. We'll have a lovely time. So everybody is invited and we welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Larry. I can just this on that. And we are on the yeah. first between 10 and 12. We will coordinate with Liz Recruiting with the, the bright side efforts to do the cleanup of the house. We are going to, she's been willing to offer to bring to us gloves, yeah. uh, bags, things of that sort to the people in the ballpark so that we can, prior to the fall festival launching, we do a cleanup in the church and triangle area. For those of you that live in the triangle or would like to participate in the triangle, we'd love to have you come by and cut a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, I promise you we'll give you bags, gloves, and you can go out and help clean up. Mm -hmm. Also, the last thing is we will have a booth that uh, the triangle will have. We will sell t shirts and hopefully other pairs of naked. Uh, and we'll also have information about 
Thank you all for being here. Please stick around. Yes. Yes. Work. I know there's more conversation to be had. Thank you.